Good evening. He says a thousand days from now he'll be premier. Do you think it's really possible at all? First, here's Ted with a rundown. Tonight on Webster, one of Canada's best kept secrets is our role as a major military equipment exporter to the rest of the world. It's a $3 billion a year business, and some of that money comes straight from third world coffers and as far away as Iran. So are we warmongers or the global peacekeepers we claim to be? Later with Webster, former moderator of the United Church of Canada, Lois Wilson, and author Ernie Rieger on Canada's most deadly export. But first, he beat Van Der Zam once. Can he do it again? Former Vancouver Mayor Mike Harcourt is now the new provincial NDP leader, ascending one more rung on the political ladder. Can he lead his party to victory in the next election? Now the fight is on the Premier's home field. In the studio with Webster, Mike Harcourt and his plans for the party. And a question, Mike, Mr. Harcourt, way out in left field. When you're elected a thousand days from now, will you follow NDP policy and invite Dr. Morgan Toller into open freestanding abortion clinics? No, what we'll help introduce, Jack, is what our policy is to make sure that there are community care clinics, community health clinics, where women have a range of services, people have a range of services, one of which women can make a choice about having an abortion or not, a safe abortion, affiliated with hospitals as part of Medicare. That's our words, policy. You don't want to change the federal health law at the moment. You still want the hospital committees, but you would put them everywhere throughout the province. Is that correct? We would have uh, the accessibility of, under the existing law, which we'd like to change. We'd like to see women having the freedom of choice with their family physician and their family to make that tough choice. All right, now let me try another one, yeah. keeping it as succinctly as I can. Having absorbed totally the trade union position on bills 19 and 20, do you think this will lead to another solidarity movement in which you must, as leader of the NDP, take an active part? Well, we analyzed those bills ourselves, Jack, and we came to the conclusion that Bills 19 and 20, the Labor Relations Reform Act and the Teaching Profession Act, are very destructive. They are going to do all sorts of uh, negative things to put labor management relations uh, back in the last century instead of into the next century. And we think the consequences of people's reactions to that is going to be bad for British Columbia. But you're going to stand on the sideline very quietly and let the labor oh, no. movement lead the fight no, no, all no, the no, way, no, no, no. and you're not going to join in any of the protests at all. You're going to be Mr. Middle of the Road. No. Some people are calling you Mr. Milk Toast already. Well, thank you for the compliment, Jack. That's the kindest thing you've said in a long time. I, I uh, said at the beginning of the convention in Vancouver, that uh, we were going to maintain our support for the principle of trade unionism, free collective bargaining. We are very aggressively, clearly, courageously laying out our criticisms of the bills, the destruction it's going to bring, the instability. It's very militant legislation, I know. very radical legislation. I know, but, but Jack, let's, let's put it to you this way. What we are as legislators, we are there in the legislature which we were elected to do. But you're fighting for the left wing and many of the no, liberals in British Columbia. What we're fighting for is the maintenance of a, a way of life in British Columbia and in Canada, which is the right for workers to come together and to protect themselves from being exploited, to make sure that they, uh, that, that they may, can maintain that right and that they can bargain freely. That's all That's wonderful. But in the meantime, you're going to yeah. hew to policies uh, close enough to the center not to upset any liberal or small C conservative voting. That's your plan, is it not? No, my plan is... You're not going to be like... A, you're not going to be a wild man even if I hit you over the head with this labor legislation, are you? Well, I never have been. I don't intend to change, uh, Jack. I, I have right. said that the legislation, and Colin Gableon said it, New Democrats have said it, the legislation is going to bring instability, it's going to scare away investment, Let's step back and do what Bill King did in the 1970s. Bill King, Bill King called for war against this labor yeah. legislation at your convention. He says it's war. It's yeah, war. Well, it's not war for you, though, is it? It's not war for, for myself or New Democrats. We're saying let's do what we did in the 1970s, build up a consensus on labor management relations, have fair labor management legislation, and bring stability to B.C. But That's can, our position. You can take as strong a position as you like, and that's because both some of the management people and all of the union people are totally against the complex provisions in this legislation, correct? Well, you know it backwards and forwards, and you, you know darn well, Jack, that it's going to bring 
chaos my in this province. My opinion doesn't matter. You say Your what? opinion does. You're one of the most you experienced labor reporters and knowledgeable people you in this say province, that again. and you know it's chaos. What is Bill 20 and Bill 19? What are they going to bring to British Columbia? They are going to bring unrest. They are going to bring instability. They're going to bring bitterness. They're going to bring division. They're going to scare away investment. They're not going to create jobs. And you missed they the are word. wrong. You missed the word they wanted. The word chaos, chaos in industrial relations, it is going to do just that as people scramble to protect Is themselves. it not time, however, speaking, you might say, for people from the center to the right, that we cured our labor problems by having a system by which the labor minister tells me there can never again be another lengthy major strike in British Columbia. Is it not time for that, providing the proper safeguards are there? We have that already. IWA strike last winter. We have that already, Jack. The legislature can meet at any time and order past legislation right. ordering back to work. We've had that for decades. How how horrendous are the powers held by Mr. Peck, the commissioner of the IRC? They're draconian. They are absolutely draconian. To give a public servant those kinds of arbitrary powers is unheard of. Not only that, he makes recommendations through when the legislature is not meeting to the cabinet that can order anybody back to work in secret by an order in council. That is not a democratic way to govern British No, Columbia. you're wrong on that. He can, he can take a report in the final analysis in one of his three levels of powers to the cabinet and the cabin, cabinet can say end the strike. That's exactly what I said. But he then has a number of provisions by which he can end the strike, including right. fact finders, MEDARB, sole yeah. arbitrator who can supply the contract, yeah. or a public interest inquiry board person who can do the same thing. Third right. interview. Is that not a bad idea? We're doing a lot of that right now. Those are uh, under the arbitration uh, mediation uh, facilities that we have right now, under the special inquiries that can be taken up right now. Those are all there, Jack. What I'm saying is that he can make a recommendation. That can go to cabinet. They can unilaterally say back to work. He can also or give cooling off lockout. periods on his own authority at certain stages. That can happen. You, is that, that can, not you good? Can, you can order cooling off periods right now. Now, what about the fact? Is it not about time that the hiring halls, who've been accused of injustice and unfairness, were opened up? so that young trainees who can't get into the union can go straight into employment and later be forced to become members of a union if it's a union shop. You know, you know why they're not being hired? There's no jobs. 50% of the construction trades or more are unemployed. If there is no employment for the tradesmen, where is there openings for the apprentice? But do you think That's that, the point, Jack. Do you think they're trying to smash the union shop, the, the hiring uh, hall I, and the union shop? I think they've targeted the construction trades and the teachers specifically in, in this legislation. I think on top of that, they very, very insidiously put all sorts of provisions into this act that have wiped out every decision of the Labor Relations Board that employers did not like. It is a one-sided, dangerous piece of legislation. They've taken everything the employers lost in front of the old Labor Board and put it into this act and you can point to, to the please sections. the employers. And you can point to the sections. You can is, this, the sections. is this class warfare legislation? Well, it's certainly not bringing consensus and cooperative labor management relations to British Columbia, I'll tell you that. What do you think of the provision that unions can no longer in their contracts put in the rights that supplies coming to them must be union. In other words, any company, despite a contract, can now go to non-union suppliers. Was it not about time that that was brought in? Well, whether it's time or not, my point is, and New Democrats' point is, who's talked about these provisions? This is something that should be laid before the people of British Columbia, which is exactly what we're saying in the House, Jack. Pull the legislation. Let's do what we did in the 1970s, is to have New Democrats, social creditors, go throughout the province and get a consensus on these things. We haven't talked about these you, in an election, in a budget, in a throne speech. This has all been dumped on us mischievously a week before the New Democrat convention, by the way. can take away your headlines. Well, it doesn't matter the headlines, uh, but it's... Uh, What's wrong with the new laws spirit? which aim at restricting primary picketing mm. literally to the, uh, the workplace of the dispute? and any particular ally doing that struck plant's work. Why is that not a good thing? Instead of seeing the huge explosions we had of secondary boycotts, yeah. which affected many people not in the labor dispute. Yeah, I'm not disputing that there may be room, and there is room, 
for reform in labor management relations. The Labor Relations Act was written in 1973. It's 15 years later. We should be able to sit down and do that. It's how you do it and on whose behalf you do it. And what's happened here is an arbitrary set of legislation has been dumped on the province, and it has been done in a very biased and confrontational way. Those are the points we're trying to make. Hoist it. Let's go back and talk to people. Did the school teachers not get what they asked for? One, they got a professional college just like the nurses. They didn't ask for that. They, they want professional status and no, union they did, status. They, they did not ask for the separation of the professional and professional development functions from the BC. Is it not good and Federation. fair that they can now organize their union locals in every district and uh, negotiate with the ultimate right to strike when they refuse? They don't have the right to strike under the Bill 19. Bill 20 says they do. Bill 19 takes it away. Bill 19 could take it away if we'll those measures are we'll used. We'll take it away because of two reasons. One, those measures will be used because they're there to be used. Secondly, uh, they have very uh, cleverly put into the provisions that the employer's ability to pay is uh, predominant and therefore any wage increases you may be able to negotiate you won't get. So That's not only can not strike. These are only those under uh, arbitration. If you come to a voluntary settlement, Peck can't do anything. If it's an arbitrated settlement, he must follow the fiscal guidelines of the government if they say they have no money. That's right. And that right now, there's the ability to negotiate through the BC Teachers Federation. They have not been given the right to strike if you go through that bill in some detail. They've been given it, but they, can't, but they can it's be been filed. Taken away. More it's with been Mike Harcourt, leader of the NDP in Victoria, after the break. You'll agree the province is in bad financial shape. He's going for an $850 million deficit. What's the worst thing he's done to people, from your point of view, as the leader of all the NDP in the province, apart from the Labour Code? Apart from the Labour Code and apart from abdicating leadership on the Native people, I think it's well, the... Well, just stop there. Are you, would you have booed, too, when Van der Zam at the Constitution said he would not sign indefinable Native rights for the 300... Tribes in BC. It's his responsibility to help define those jacks. He has been a leader in this province for 12 years. There are not 300 tribes. There are 27 tribal councils right. who have worked out very clear positions and what they mean by self-government. There it has been lots of opportunity for the premier to sit down with those Indian leaders and to work out what is meant. He and not was meant. faced. He could have sat down and explained this to the people of British Columbia and gone to that conference and being a new father of confederation instead he blew that opportunity jack it's tragic it's sad it's going to lead the natives back to the court to more instability between the labor legislation and the instability but of that he was being asked to sign unstable. undefined native rights in an area where 70 percent of british columbia is under claim because he, surely you wouldn't have signed that because he refused to sit down and to negotiate and to discuss with the native people what they wanted did this he was deserve to be booed he deserved to be criticized for not doing his homework, for not showing leadership, for leaving himself in a state of what I call willful blindness. He's refused to understand self-government. This doesn't mean Aboriginal title. This does not mean settlement of land claims. Self-government yes, means, it no, it doesn't. It's a different concept, Jack. It, it's it defining, doesn't. defining, allowing each tribe to define its inherent claims to territory, no, it's many not. of which overlap, no. with no. nobody put up for paying the bills. That is Aboriginal title. That is not self government. All right, let's try something. There are else. 27 self governments right now in British Columbia. So we should have 27 more Indian land claims. All, in no, that doesn't, it's not land claims. That's a separate issue, I'm, I'm trying to tell you. And this is why Bill Van Der Zelm has let you down, has let the people of British Columbia down. He should have made that clear. There already exists, Jack. There All are right. 27 tribal councils right now carrying out a lot of these functions. He should have known that. The people of B.C. should have known that. Instead, he stayed in the dark, left the people of B.C. in the dark, and unsure of what is, is expected. But the How worst, the worst uh, uh, thing that's happened in British Columbia, and we're disappointed, we're really disappointed, is the lack of a clear job creation strategy in either the throne speech or in the budget. The budget is more of the same depression. But, well, he's given us one strategy, privatization. What would you say if, it was, if we were going to privatize ICBC? 
why did we bring about an ICBC in the first place? Because the NDP people, brought it in. Because people were being badly abused by the private insurance companies. Are you in That's why these things happen. Are you I think ICBC should stay. It is, it is a very successful, although flawed, as any large institution is, uh, it should stay and be improved. That's why Ontario is starting to look at uh, that type of insurance. Are you in favor of what seems to be a move towards the privatization of the entire liquor system? With liquor available as freely as it is in California. Now, do you have a do you have an answer for me? On yes, that? very clear answer. What's your answer? No. You would keep the LCB and the LDB and all we the don't rest think of it. That we don't think that uh, Nirvana is a liquor store and a gambling casino on every corner, like some people do, Jack. Mm -hmm. We seem to think that there are enough places to, to be able to go out and buy booze right now. There's enough ways to throw your money away in in the lotteries and at horse races and other things without encouraging them to be in every neighborhood. What do you think is his intention when he increases the grants to the independent schools by 42 percent? And doesn't increase uh, educational financing of the public school system? It speaks for itself. What about user fees for the old folks who go to podiatrists, etc., and chiropractors? Would you have, you might have had to do that. No, I think there's many other things we could have done with that budget that weren't done that Dave Stupich brought out in our, uh, our alternate budget sp uh, speech. Would I wouldn't have done that to the seniors. I would not have done that uh, to the seniors in terms of uh, making sure they have to pay a hundred dollars minimum uh, property tax five. now, oh, yes. minimum property tax, mm -hmm. to bring in these user fees right out of the blue for seniors. There were a bunch of things that were done that were unfair. How far to the right do you think he's going? Well, I told him today in the House that uh, when he congratulated me for being elected uh, the leader of the opposition, Mr. Uh, Premier did. Uh, I congratulated him on the, some cooperation that's happened between our caucuses. More money for research. But you know what I said? I said, listen, if you, we'll show that cooperation. You give me some gardening tips and I'll give you some golf tips because I'm worried about your swing. You're starting to slice far to the right, too far to the right. It would going off the fairway almost, Jack. It would seem that you're slicing a little to the right yourself on your moderate approach to most things instead of hooking to the left. Now, well, you've seen me drive. I drive straight down the middle and sometimes a little draw to the left. Would you have dragged the uranium protesters' tents off the lawns? No, no. You no. just let them stay there like they did in Ottawa with that huge mess. Well, and they, and they did in Queen's Park. That's what democracy is all about, is dissent. If they're not uh, causing a health hazard, you know what he said? He said they're litter. The Premier said these people are littering the lawns of the legislature. I'll bet you most people were glad to see these protesters dragged off the lawns they of the legislature. They may feel that. They may feel that, but that doesn't mean that's what you do with an opinion you don't happen to agree with. Eh? Mm -hmm. Were they doing anything illegal? Were they uh, causing a nuisance to anybody? It was just something you didn't like. They were an you eyesore. You don't remove people because they're an eyesore or, they're, or for aesthetic reasons. They were expressing something that they felt very strongly about. Right. The, the teachers are talking about striking now, before, obviously, before the legislation comes in. Will you give them moral and verbal support to strike in protest against what you called these draconian labor laws? Well, we are not going to, as a caucus, uh, do anything unlawful or promote anything that is unlawful. I've made that very clear. We support the reasons for the concern of teachers, of not just trade unionists, but business leaders at this unfair and destabilizing legislation. And we understand the frustration and the anger behind a lot of the decisions of business people, of trade unionists, of non-trade unionists, if we start to roll back the protections we've built up over the last many decades. What about the hungry children in Vancouver schools? Would you have acted on that or would you yes. just leave it? No, I wouldn't leave it. What would you would have hot meals for school children throughout the province of BC? Well, first of all, I would have made sure that the kids are fed. That's the point. Food banks in the schools. The, the kids are fed. Meals. Do you think we need food banks in the schools? I think we need kids not being hungry in the schools, Jack. How can you learn if you've got an empty stomach? Mm -hmm. That's the issue. Not whether parents are uh, not taking care of their kids or not. I said to the Premier today in the House, mm -hmm. Mr. Premier, you have enough proof right across British Columbia that kids are hungry. There's up to 20,000 elementary and high school students in British Columbia. But before you can increase welfare, you've got to increase revenues. You, do you know, want to know something? The welfare rates go right back into the economy. People buy more food. They buy clothes. The money goes right back into the economy. People on welfare, Jack, have not had an increase for five years. They had a small one this year that brought them up to 1982 cost of living. Mm -hmm. So they're five years behind in the cost of living. So we said two things. One, emergency of 
programs in the schools so kids have decent nourishment. We don't want our kids suffering. Whatever the reason, let's not squabble about it. Make sure the kids are fed. And then let's deal with the lack of income for a lot of the low-income people. But as far as the labor laws are concerned, you're going to sit fairly quietly on the sidelines, not encouraging any form of solidarity, which I can see building up among the labor movement. And you're going to take a very mild-mannered approach to everything so that you won't lose any support from the center of the electoral well, belt. I don't call doing my duty, which is being a legislator, and expressing our concerns mm -hmm. in the people's parliament very passionately, very clearly, very critically, uh, as being mild-mannered. I see that as what we were elected to do, of expressing our opinions in the legislature, mm -hmm. expressing them on the Jack Webster show, expressing them in, in meetings and rallies, lawfully. Fair enough. That's how, what we'll do. How long will you filibuster? Can you filibuster on the labor bill? And no, if so, how long? We're not going to filibuster. We've made that clear. What we are going to do, though, is to take all the time that's necessary to point out the, in detail the flaws of this bill and to point out the philosophy behind it, Jack, which is basically, if you look at the philosophy behind it, it's a non-union province. It's a province where 20% are the owners of business and their, and their professional advisors, and 80% are poor. 80%? 80%. The rest of the people have no protection. They are basically economic serfs. That's predict, the vision behind that. Will you predict now that van der Sam will self-defeat himself and has got virtually no public support for bills 19 and 20? Oh, I won't predict that he'll, he'll uh, self-destruct. Uh, no, it's, uh, there's not an election for three years. Very popular But I think man. that he is being seen uh, more and more as an intolerant man as somebody who does not think through the consequences of his actions and his, his uh, uh, legislation. And I think that's starting to disturb far more British Columbians. Your questions now to Mike, Hart, Mike uh, Harcourt, leader of the NDP in the House of Victoria. All right. You see, Michael, as a guy who was involved with you from the moment you started in your storefront law business, God knows how many years ago, you've always been fairly mellow and fairly mild. Yeah. I doubt if that's going to win you many converts in the political arena in this ebullient British Columbia. Well, I think it is. I mean, we had a choice in 1984. But you're, you're going you're to be an ebullient and confrontational person who ran against me, Bill Vanderzell. He oh. got shellacked. <laughs> that he was got 19. shellacked. Because you beat him in Vancouver doesn't mean you could of beat him. Of course not. Today, he'd wipe the floor with you. Oh, I don't think so at all. I mean, I've been out throughout this province, Jack, for the last uh, 30, two months. And I've been traveling through B.C. for the last uh, 20 years. And I look forward to the next uh, provincial election. And you're not me. still a city slicker at heart, No, though. no, no. I've, I tell you, the, what I've discovered talking to thousands of British Columbians is I have a high-profile, positive, people feel comfortable. Not a problem. And you're handsome even if bald. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Good, good evening, Jack. Congratulations, Mike, on your uh, recent nomination. Uh, get to the point. Okay, I'll get to the point, Jack. I know you're impatient. Um, what I wanted to say about this legislation is something that hasn't been said in the time I've been listening to you guys. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, there's two words that haven't been mentioned here in this legislation. It's right to work uh, and union bashing. That's lying under the surface. Uh, all the signs are there, and uh, there's going to be a rally tomorrow, and I hope that any union member and any concerned person that wants to voice their opinion on okay, this legislation. Okay, okay. You realize, of course, that if a union man now loses his membership in the union, he cannot be fired unless he didn't pay dues. Do you regard that as a kind of right to what piece of legislation? Oh, it is. It takes away the sanctions that unions have against their membership. So Van der Zyme is in favor at least of limited right to work, correct? That's a pretty substantial Mack truck drive through uh, that part of the trade union's uh, ability to discipline members for going against the will of the majority. And do you think the ability to hire trainees and apprentices through the union shop is the same form of right to work, even though if it's a union shop, they must join eventually? Yeah, what they've done is three or four different things uh, for the construction trades. They've made it easier for the employer to double breast, which means he can set up a non-union affiliate, which he can slide all these people over. See, there's a whole bunch of sections, if you add them up, basically boil down to a rollback of 50 to 60 years. Double breasting. The key man yep. concept is yep. now okay. That's right. But he can only have, the, the union contractor can only have a passive interest in the non-union double-breasted company. Right. There's a whole bunch of provisions there that roll us back 50 years. 
Van der Zam sent us back 50 years. Sending us back 50 years, if you look at the lack of protections that people had in the 1930s. Serious question, even though I'm supposed to be taking phone calls. Do, does not the majority person in British Columbia believe it's time the union's wings were clipped a little bit? Well, they've been clipped mightily, Jack, in the last uh, five years. They by the economy. By the economy, by legislation. There's been some very substantial changes to the Labor Act over the last five mm -hmm. years. Better get the calls. Go yeah. ahead, please. Yeah, Mr. Webster. Yes. Um, I've been on a union hiring hall list now for three years, and it looks like hopefully this spring or summer I'll be going back to work. But I'm telling you, if this legislation comes in, we're gone. The union hiring halls will be history, and you're going to have people out in the streets, and you're going to think solidarity was rolling before. I don't think it's going to stop this time, because the labor movement, I felt, at the meetings I've been to, was sold down the road when the uh, Kelowna Accord came through, and they're not about to be suckered again. Okay, what do you say to that? That's rough talk, isn't it? Well, that's, that's what I'm saying, Jack. When people's lives are being threatened, when their very way of existence is gone, they're going to be treated like economic serfs, they're not going to take it lying down. Go ahead, please. Mr. Harcourt, as a teacher and supporter of the NDP, I would ask you to state more specifically what the NDP party plans to do about these obviously destructive acts, Bills 19 and 20. Do you have an action plan? Yes, we do, and we're doing it right now, ma'am, in the House. Will you cooperate with the B.C. Fed on it? Well, we've had discussions with the B.C. Fed. We've had discussions with the building trades. We've had discussions with the B.C. Uh, but you're not TF. going to ally yourself closely with organized labor, are you? Well, we're holding discussions with them. We have a plan of attack, ma'am, in the legislature. We're opposing these bills. Our, our strategy is to have the bills pulled go out throughout British Columbia and have a chance to have some input on that. We're still waiting for the teachers to give us a clear indication of what they have planned to do. We haven't received that yet. Well, they said they're going to strike if necessary. Well, that was one of the statements, but it still is, is, is unclear. When can these bills be passed? How quickly? Oh, we're, we're looking at a few weeks yet because they've got to go through second reading to committee and back to the House. Go ahead, please. But why? You, you're not going to filibuster. No, we're going to lay out clearly what we think is wrong with can, these are bills. Are you allowed to filibuster under no, the rules of the No, they can do closure. They can do closure. Go yeah. ahead, please. Yeah, Mr. Harcourt, how, how come the NDP always thinks there's a bottomless uh, bucket that they can get these funds out of? We don't, sir. And why, we don't. you know, part two of my question is, is yeah. why do they want to put in mandatory uh, daycare centers? Does this not just help? Uh, what people what just mandatory? go out and have babies just for the sake of uh, they can no. shuffle them away into a daycare no. center? No, that's, that's, federal a, that's, a, that's federal NDP policy. Well, that's policy. a silly question. I mean, people just don't have babies so they can put them in daycare centers. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, uh, good evening, folks. Can yes. you tell me what is your outlook on the Hyundai Kirkhoff Bridge at uh, New Westminster with all these South Koreans doing the work that... Uh, BC unions or non-union people could do? Well, I understand okay, that they've had you. to bring in a whole bunch, Hyundai's had to bring in a whole bunch of people because there wasn't sufficient trained people uh, locally that uh, were non-union and uh, it's uh, created some problems, but that's just uh, information that I've had passed on to me. Oh, immigration would stop that, bringing in people if there were skilled no, they've, Canadians they've, available they've, to they've, do the they've job. Had, I'm, I'm saying that, that that has been a very controversial project. And it's part of where you try and mix union and non-union and where you try and make up for a lack of skilled people in the non-union sector in these areas by bringing in a company from outside. I think that's unfortunate. We've got lots of talented people right here in British Columbia who are unemployed. Go we ahead, please. Them. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yep. Yeah, I like him the, uh, wish him the best as uh, the new leader of the NDP. That's Thank you, a sir. short thing. Great. Also, as far as apprentices go, I've been a uh, union member for 25 years. I worked eight months last year. I worked, just got back to work. I've been back working for four months. What union I was an apprentice, uh, in, apprentice uh, in another trade many years ago, and I was kept on for about three years, and I was laid off, and they hired more apprentices. And that's the way I look at this new labor bill, as hiring apprentices and laying them off uh, shortly before they they're, uh, become journeymen and hiring more. That's right. That's uh, one and, of the things we're also, worried about. Uh, on this, uh, I also took a course, this is a little bit online, but... No, I no, don't first. tell me the course, I've got your message. Do you think the union should stop cooperating in all government boards and whatnot, including the alcohol and drug gay program well, in which they're involved? What I think is that we should go back to why are they feeling this anger? Why are they feeling this threatened? Why are they feeling this, this uh, disturbed about the legislation, Jack? 
why don't we get rid of the cause of this unrest, which is this badly thought out or too well thought out bill that's going to just wipe back 50 years. If you were going to have 50 years of your work, of your life's work, taken away from you by somebody, would you be inclined to sit down and sup with them? Tell well, me, would you be inclined to sit down and cooperate with them? Would you? The answer is obvious. Go That's ahead. Right. The answer is no. Go ahead from Victoria. Yes, uh, Mr. Harcourt, uh, many British Columbians can't afford to get training, whether it's in college or university, because we have high tuition fees and we have new, no student grant program. If you form the government three or four years down the road, w would you be prepared to do things which means that um, all British Columbians are, have a chance to get, to get a university or college education, and it won't be limited whether or not they ha have parents who are wealthy. Yes, we very clearly said that one of the major investments that we would make is in our young. Through the education system, if you don't have an education, you've got real problems. We would restore the grant part of the grant loan program and make sure that we stabilize fees, we make it easier for people from rural areas to come to university and to do some institutions outside of the lower Go Maine. ahead from Trail. Yeah, thank you. Congratulations, Mike. And Thank you. I, have, I have to agree with you. I think the legislation is just devastating. I think it also, um, I'd like you to bring up this point. Doesn't it take away all public sectors' right to strike? No. Well, it, it, it essentially does because it talks yeah. about the ability to pay, mm -hmm. the ability to pay of the employer. It's also not in the public's interest. Yeah, well, it's, well, listen, no. it's got so many sections in there we should explain that, that in essence really do reduce the concept of trade unionism and free collective bargaining Public to a shadow of itself. Public sector employees come under, in effect, a form of CSP on ability to pay. That's right. And they also come under essential services. That's right. A form of, which is ill defined, which is ill defined right Does now. Does the fact that essential services now includes a general reference to the welfare, not meaning welfare rates, yeah. really make you feel this is draconian? It says economic well-being, welfare, educational, etc. That's right. It's it's very loosely defined. Are you suggesting far too that? Broad powers are you the, suggesting uh, therefore that if the IWA went on strike, they could be ordered back as an essential service? for the welfare and well-being of the economy of the province. Well, you said that the Minister of Labor has stated that there will never be a prolonged strike. Does that mean two days? Does that mean two weeks? There will never be a prolonged strike again in British Columbia. No, it means 28 days plus reports from Mr. Peck, maybe 50 or 60 days. Yeah. Thank you. More calls to Mike Harcourt after the break. So things have been fairly pleasant up to now in the legislature. Is that right, Mr. Harcourt? Well, we started with uh, high expectations, as did most British Columbians, Jack, and then the The only thing that budget. upsets you really is the Labour Code. Oh, the no. We, we got very disappointed with the throne speech and with the budget's lack of uh, uh, vision for uh, programs for job creation. The uh, dismay it's turned to over the last little while with the abdication of leadership on the native issue and uh, utter dismay with the the chaos and the oh, and, uh, what's going to be brought by this labor go ahead please go ahead please oh i want to speak to mike go, go ahead, ahead sir i wanted to ask him whether he had looked at the overall picture and seen what the uh, yeah. uh what what the union movement had done in britain as compared to what has happened in the uh, japanese economy for example yes i have sir i've studied both and uh, Great Britain is quite different than, than British Columbia and Canada. 
uh, as is the, uh, the Japanese model. It's based on a paternalistic uh, company that takes care of you from beginning to end, including full employment. Uh, that's based on the Japanese uh, character and personality and uh, culture. It's quite different than British Columbia. Uh, what we need to do here in British Columbia, I believe, is to review the Labor Relations Act, to look at how we can modernize our economy, train our workers, to try and bring a more cooperative framework. There's a bunch of initiatives that have been attempted by the employers and the unions. There's lots we could do, sir. I don't disagree with us having a look. Let's get to local calls. Yep. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yep. Mr. Harcourt, yes, I can't believe what a hypocrite you are. You say you're concerned yeah. about the well-being of the children at our schools and that you and your party are in favor of abortions? I'll tell you something. I think you're a devil not, in the we're, form of light. We're and not if in I'm favor. around in this city... We're not in favor in of abortion. Sir, let me, let me straighten that out. We're I'm not in favor of abortion. In your own writing. And I'll tell you something. Yeah. I'll defeat you. Yeah, I we're promise not, you that. Yeah. Okay, well, first of all, you're wrong. We're not in favor of abortion. You're in favor of pro-choice. We're, we're not in favor of abortion. That's a very important distinction. Our, our oh, position yes. is that that is a choice of a woman with her doctor and family. It's a tough choice, but it's, we're not, we're not pro-abortion pro at all. We're pro-choice. Big difference. Go ahead, please. Yeah, in regards to the labor code being towards the business rather than the labor, I have to agree with that because if the business has no room to breathe, how can it support any workers? But with this new labor code, it does have room, so it can support more workers. Well, you see, the other way of looking at that, and this is what's so frightening about the vision that's behind this code, if you talk to some of the more fervent supporters of it, what they see is us becoming like a right-to-work state like Alabama. They want to regularize us with uh, our Pacific Rim uh, uh, countries like uh, Taiwan, like uh, Korea. Korea, like Chile, where there's a very, very uh, controlled, obedient workforce, and basically turn our workers into economic serfs. And but people in British Zan, Columbia aren't going to accept that. The Van der Zand government hasn't really a developed or expressed the real right-wing formula. And sure, Mr. Van der Zand would say he wants to avoid confrontation. He just wants to balance, tilt the labor laws a little bit away from the incredible pro-labor tilt that existed before. It wasn't a pro-labor tilt. Did you remember the labor movement in 1973? They scorned that code. They scorned the code. Do you remember what Bill King put up with in 1973? Social Credit and the NDP both, both voted, voted for, for that it. Code. That's right. Go ahead, please. Thank you. I am definitely against unions, and I would like to ask why, if you want to work for a sawmill, you must join a union. You have no other choice. You have to join a union or you won't get the work. Well, that depends Me, on the not sawmill. freedom of, of work or freedom of choice. Yeah, that depends on the sawmill, ma'am. There are uh, non-union sawmills, there are union sawmills, but that's a decision of the particular workers in that mill to, to do that. That's what free collective bargaining, that's what uh, trade unionism and the choice but to the, do that is all about. But the incredible thing, the thing in is, if you go as a young man and that's the only job you can take, they will ask you to pay so much into your pension fund, and by the time you get pension age, you will get $1,000 when you have provided to that union $650,000. No, no, don't make that, that point, ma'am. No, that's an make, actuarially sound program, The point you should make, ma'am, and the only thing that's really visible in the legislation is that if you are a member of a union shop and you lose your membership for any reason other than failure to pay your dues and assessments, you cannot now be fired. There was a time when you lost your union membership under the Constitution, you could be fired. Her question so, was at the start, though, Jack. It was getting into work at the sawmill. And that's well, the decision of the workers there. Well, that's a democratic decision, like any other organization. Majority, rule of the that's majority. Right. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'm calling from Penticton, and I'm also a teacher. And I was just wondering if Mr. Harcourt had any solutions for the teachers other than strike. I really disagree with strikes for teachers. I feel that it's not setting a good example for the children, and it just doesn't solve any problems. Well, ma'am, I, I think the solution is for us to go back and talk to the BC school trustees, and I've talked to Eric Buckley, who's from the uh, Okanagan, from Kelowna, who's the head of the BC school trustees, to talk to teachers, talk to parents, talk to people who are basically concerned about the education system, and do something that works with teachers. Teachers want to maintain the professional training, the professional monitoring of the skills of their own members. They want to also have the right to strike, not as diffuse, small, divide and conquer, balkanized units. There's ways that we can improve the education system by going back and working something out voluntarily My in that area. The other thing we can do, Jack, is to have a decent 
Royal Commission with people of the stature of, of Mr. Justice Nathan the Metz and others to bring in some changes to our education system so it works more effectively for our young. We have a Royal Commission to death on education. No, we haven't. Just one we haven't had a decent one for uh, 20 years. One uh, final fact. The teachers' college gives them a professional ethical group in which they have the voting majority. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that yeah. is that the others have been, that have been introduced have been introduced voluntarily. Lawyers, accountants, doctors, nurses have asked for that separation. The okay. teachers haven't asked for that. My thanks to you, Michael Harcourt, leader of the NDP, and we shall watch with interest as yeah. you continue not to advocate anything illegal and they won't even join in protests about the Labour Court. Oh, well, I, I'll be involved in some large meetings and on programs like yours expressing our concerns about the mm. legislation. Good to see you again. Good to see you too, Mike. Yeah. Try and hook to the left a bit instead of slicing to the right after the break. First, my apologies to my final guests tonight because I was going to put them on earlier but couldn't let go of Mike Harcourt. And they are Lois Wilson, the former president of the World Council of Churches, and Mr. Ernie Regeer, who is the research director of Project Plowshares. I hadn't heard about you for such a long time. I thought you were out plowing the ground somewhere. <laughs> now, I understand the theme of your book is that Canada is an evil country because it is deeply involved in the deadly business of military exports. So what else do you expect if it supplies jobs? Canada, uh, the point of the book is not that Canada is an evil uh, country, but the point is that there are better ways of supplying jobs than that afforded by uh, producing military commodities. There, there are, it's now old news from economists that if you want to produce jobs that the military spending in fact is one of the least uh, least effective and Canada is now working into an export market to the to deliver third uh, military commodities to third world countries at a time when a whole lot of other countries are doing the very same and it's a very competitive market and they're not really going to be successful at now it. you're from Ontario right right now I am. and you're from Ontario right yeah, right and you've got four percent unemployed in that triangle down in the south right Okay, mm -hmm. if you offered us an arms plant in British Columbia tomorrow, employing 500 people, there would be 50,000 people looking for jobs mm -hmm. there. Now, mm -hmm. could you blame them for that? No, but I think what uh, there needs to be a lot more work done on the conversion of jobs for really war to jobs for peace. I'm not an economist. I don't know how to do that, but I think that the public is would welcome that initiative. I mean, you know, Ernie's book is really to support the whole peace and, peace and disarmament initiative in Canada, which I think is a very important uh, I thought we'd thing. kind of lost sight of the peace and disarmament initiative in Canada, even though I had it said on the television this afternoon that the Russians and the Americans are now talking about the possibility of some arms agreement. Mm -hmm. All right, how much do we produce in the way of arms? What are they, where do we sell them? We produce about $3 billion a year worth of uh, military commodities, which includes weapons that actually go bang as well as, a, as the support services for those. About two-thirds of that is exported. Eighty percent of that goes to the United States and then the rest goes to NATO partners and to the third world. And the Canadian industry is unique in this one regard and that is that we produce military commodities not for Canada's de defense but for export markets. We, it's in response to a to economic demand, not in response to defense requirements. To whom do we sell these arms apart from the ones we sell under agreement with the United States? Well, we sell to uh, Chile, to uh, Indonesia, South Korea, Saudi Arabia, Taiwan, Pakistan, Syria. We sell to a whole range of countries where, that are known as human rights violators or where there are where there's actual warfare uh, being carried on, such as Indonesia, both in in violation of Canadian uh, guidelines for the export of military I've never heard about this before. Does the World Council of Churches uh, object to us selling any arms at all? It certainly uh, asks the member churches to raise the question. I mean, I was in Chile last September, and uh, at the time when the assassination attempt took place on Pinochet's life, and we saw, we saw the whole paraphernalia of, of military out there. And uh, I, I would hate to think that... Uh, uh, you know, of Canada's complicity in that, both because of the support of militarism and also the distortion it makes in the economies of those countries. 
But it helps our economy to the tune of how much did you say a year? Three billion, three billion a year. The, the, the problem, however, is that that is going to come to an end. The Reagan arms boom, which is the main, main source of that, that market, isn't going to last forever. The economic repercussions of that are going to come. And uh, the, the point is that we are not going to get a, an offer for a 500 job plant in, in southern uh, British Columbia because there isn't, there, the market isn't there. You have to try very hard for the market. And the Canadian government, in fact, subsidizes the industry to the tune of 150 million to 200 million a year just in order to get into that market. Subsidizes it. Right. Uh, from uh, Public funds go into the industry to help them get into the into the export market because it's a highly competitive market. But it's also a highly technical market and is it not a fact that Canada, if it weren't for industries like Spar Aerospace, makers of the Canada Arm, that we would fall far behind the rest of the world in the use of the new technologies. Is that not a fact? No, it's not, hey. a, it's not a fact. In fact, the uh, SPAR's most innovative technology is not military technology, it's civilian satellite uh, technology. The, um, uh, in fact, the, the, the vaunted spin-off from military production, the, a former IBM scientist said should ought to be called the drip-off because there is very little, in fact, spillover from military production to civilian. Yeah, but there has to be some uh, accountability of the, of the development of new technology to, re to human needs. And uh, I mean, there has to be some ethical framework in which this is put, I think, and uh, that's part of our effort to make sure that happens. Just a minute, let me get this clear. Of all, uh, what, we produce guns? Yes, we produce some guns. We pr produce uh, air-to-ground rockets. We produce armored vehicles, military transport aircraft. Uh, uh, we produce uh, shells, uh, uh, small arms. And they're all allowed to be exported to almost any place in the free world. Well, there are, there are uh, restrictions on it that we, we, the government says we do not sell uh, military commodities of that kind to countries at war, in, but in fact those, re those guidelines are, are violated. Do I not remember something about us supplying helicopter engines for the Iranians? Yeah. Yeah, when which, was that? which can be used for other purposes than peace. Yeah. And we said they were for civilian helicopters, yeah, yeah. as yeah. I recall. Well, that's it's usually the line. That's what do you want yeah. people to do? We might have time for a couple of calls. Yeah. I don't know, yeah. have we? Well, yes. I think I think the, the the very first thing that people that people should do is call for the government to disclose fully mm -hmm. information about the arms trade. One of the reasons that people don't know about it is that the Canadian government is unique in the veil of secrecy that it puts over the whole industry. I remember Mulroney saying that. Uh, his government, our government, would not take any part in SDI officially. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, but but d d private manufacturers are allowed to do that. Well, I just remembered, yeah. weren't you once accused in the World Council of Churches of supplying money which went to the guerrillas to oh, buy yeah. arms? Yeah, you read the Reader's Digest a lot. But, uh, but the worm has turned. Now our Prime Minister is meeting with Oliver Tambo, who heads the African National Congress, who are the chief recipients of our funds. Uh, he almost <laughs> seems that he was ad advocating some of the violence. <laughs> not really, no, but you know what no. I mean. He, he said he could understood why yeah. there could be violence yeah. well, it's around to, South yes, Africa. Well, it's to dismantle apartheid, right. I believe I've got a call for you here. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I have a question. I wanted to know why it was that the World Council of Churches and uh, Project Plowshares uh, will not mention the fact that the Soviet Union is the largest exporter of arms to the world, mm -hmm. and why both organizations also uh, are bent on uh, disarming the West and uh, and really have no input into disarming the Soviet Union at the same time. Do you want to start? Well, the Soviet Union and the United States jo jointly are the main suppliers of, of uh, weapon systems to the third world. And our, our point on, in calling for Canada to uh, adopt a much more restrictive policy is also that it join this action with a strong diplomatic effort internationally to place the whole question of arms trade control on the international agenda. You know, there's not now a single disarmament forum in which the control of the international arms trade is, is on the agenda. And as far as the World Council of Churches goes, I think if you examine our statements, you'll find them even-handed. That is not the public perception, but we have very strong statements on the USSR and Afghanistan. Unfortunately, we have about as much influence on the USSR as we have on the USA. My thanks to Lois Wilson and to Ernie Aragir. Arms Canada. After the break. <laughs>
Stan Hagen, Minister of Advanced Education on the new student loan program, and also Dr. Baruti Galdikas, world-famous primatologist, 5 p.m. precisely.